Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Coffee Chats. We're going to give it just about a minute here before we get started. So um, your coffee. I don't want to say buckle your seatbelts, but we're going to have a good conversation. So we'll get things going here in about 30 seconds to a minute. All right, we'll get things rolling here. I think we'll have a few more join us, but in the meantime, if you um, haven't been with us for a coffee chat before, I recognize many faces. Um, welcome to Coffee Chats with Economic Alliance. I'm Angie Sievers. I'm the director of the Snohomish STEM Network in partnership with Economic Alliance and also part of the Broadband Action Team. So I'm happy to, to bring a couple of um, really uh, important and um, informed speakers to the conversation today. Um, definitely, as you all know, um, engage in the conversation using the chat to ask your questions. Um, and I'm just going to dive right into it and introduce um, our speakers. So first with us, um, many of you probably know Russ Elliott. He's a director of the Washington State Broadband Office. He's been directed by Washington State Governor Inslee to put the interests of people above all personal and private interests in solving the state's digital divide. Um, that's so well been highlighted in the last year or so in light of, of what we've all been living in. Um, also, we have with us Nate Nearing, who is a Snohomish County Council member representing District 1 which includes cities of Arlington, Darrington, Granite Falls, Marysville, Stanwood, and unincorporated North County. Uh, he's in, partnered with Executive Summers and Council Member Lowe um, to help start the broadband action team here in Snohomish County, which many of you are part of. Um, Lois Langer Thompson is the Executive Director of Snow Owl Libraries, providing services to over 850,000 residents in Snohomish and Island counties. Our communities have access to 23 libraries, bookmobiles, in-building and online resources. So our libraries is leading the charge to provide equitable access to devices and high-speed broadband to students, job seekers and community members while adapting to the increasing demands of remote school work and healthcare. Um, and I just wanna say kudos to Snow Isle and the hard work they've done in the last year to connect um, students, families and businesses in this really challenging time. Um, both Council Member Nate Nearing and Lois Langer Thompson serve on Economic Alliance's Board of Trustees. So um, we're going to get right to it. Again, use the chat to, to ask questions and engage. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Russ to get us started. He's going to set the stage. Well, thank you, Angie, and thanks, everyone. And it's so cool to be here. I, I can't tell you how excited I am about the work that's going on up in Snohomish County and uh, under uh, Nate's leadership there and some of the other stuff that's going on. It's been exciting to see how uh, the energy is growing. Uh, we're starting to identify opportunities and uh, projects. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> one of your citizens called me like a minute before I got on this video right here to talk about a project that we've got going on up there in Snohomish County. So excited about the, the good work going on up there. But you're right. The, the, what I loved about how you opened this today, Angie, is you said, you know, we're going to put the needs of the people ahead of self-interest. And that was kind of one of the key things when I came into this office. Actually, when I came into Wyoming, that was my first thing that I was before I was director here, I was director of Wyoming. When I walked into the directorship of their Wyoming, they said, well, we don't know what to do. And I said, well, I'll tell you what we will do. So we'll put the mission and vision ahead of everything else. And we'll make certain that we lead with that because when that's the loudest voice in the room, the people will win, you know? And so we did that and we were able to do some great things. There's a lot of people with a lot of private interests and they're out there, they're, they're supporting and lobbying for their private interests. And that's important. But at the same time, we have to we have to always be guided by the right principles and the right to mission and vision. And so this office has been stood up with the fact that we are going to continue to be champions for the people, champions for the connectivity needs in the in this state, uh, and champions for everyone. You know, we've got we've got we've got very loud voice on the on the west side of the state. You know, we have we have a quiet voice, but one that's much uh, needed to be heard in the central part of the state you know, and, and some of the north, uh, Northeast areas. So it's been very critical that we make certain that everybody has a voice and everybody gets to be heard. And, and I think so far that's resulted in tremendous success. I don't know if you've seen that 
you know, this last session, it uh, looks like the, the, the dust is starting to settle on that budget. And uh, we had good bipartisan support on broadband. It's not a partisan issue, right? When people make it a partisan issue, we lose focus on the mission and vision, don't we? So, you know, it is, it's truly been all about, you know, how do we get the most for the people in this, in this country? And we're, we're at a time now where unprecedented money, unprecedented focus, you know, through our pandemic has, uh, has, has made this a, a tremendous amount of, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity now to, to make a huge change in our connectivity and, and leadership and, and coordination and the broadband action team uh, efforts that you guys have up there that we're, we're seeing now around the state. That's where it all starts. It starts with allowing those people to have the, the, those people, the people to have a voice. And, uh, and it's exciting to, uh, to see this all kind of coming to fruition and then uh, seeing everybody get energy behind it, hyper acceleration of interest, unprecedented money. And now I think we've got planning and we've got the opportunity now in my budget, we're going to have technical support. We're going to have planning support. We're going to have grant writing support. We're going to have matching funds. So there are no more excuses. This might, it's my no excuse time to broadband for Washington state. You know, so we, and I actually made a little folder in my email. It says no excuses. That's where all this stuff goes now, you know, so we really have no excuses and we really do uh, have an opportunity to, to, to change the landscape in the state and, and do it for everybody. Make certain that we are focused on, on adding ad additional infrastructure. And at the same time, we're also focused on making certain people have access and can afford it. Making sure people have access and have the tools to uh, leverage it. It's fun to see uh, the the library here and uh, and and the, the the great work the libraries are doing in the state. That was an un, untapped resource in my brain until I got here and started working with the libraries. And we saw we saw uh, you know our 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 federally recognized and awarded program, the Drive-In Wi-Fi Project because of the help of the libraries and the good work that's going on. So we've got, we've got, you know, the energy's good that, you know, I think our focus is good. And, and I think we've got, uh, we've got the opportunity now to really change this, change this landscape. So I appreciate being here and I look forward to, you know, if there's any questions or thoughts or concerns or, or you got an address that needs to be looked up, you know, and you haven't taken my speed test. First of all, if you haven't taken my speed test and you ask me, you tell me you got bad broadband, I'm not listening to you. You got homework. If you, if you tell me you got bad broadband, you haven't taken my speed test, you got homework. Uh, if you have taken my speed test, we can sit down, chat about it, and look at it on the map and see how we're doing. But uh, that's that's what we're doing right now. A lot of work going on, a lot of public uh, focus now, as you've seen through the legislature this year. You know, we saw our public entities now get some retail authority. So we'll see some energy in the public uh, network infrastructure. You see the executive branch in, in D.C. right now talking a lot about open access public networks. You know, so we're going to see a lot of work there. So we're going to see a little bit of, of everything, and, and I want to honor private efforts as well. I want to make certain we recognize the fact that we are one of the top connected states in the country, if not the top connected state in the country, because we have leveraged, you know, the, the, the private sector's good work here. So I want to make certain that we honor that and, and do some public-private work. So excited to be here. I'll, I'll quit talking. I could talk forever. Thank you, Russ. Um, I think Lois... Can we transition yeah. to you? Unless, unless Council Member Neri, you want to, if you have some burning comments to add in. No, that's great. That's great. Okay. That's great, Lois. Great. Thank you, Lois. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Angie and EASC for um, holding this event this morning, and uh, Russ and Council Member Neri for being uh, co panelists with me. I'd like to talk a little bit about usage of the internet via small libraries and then how I see the library supporting the community going forward. Our vision is that everyone in our community is connected to their library and that connection is also uh, through the internet. In the past 15 months, there were over 1.6 million Wi-Fi connections at our library facilities. And I would note that during most of that time, our buildings were not open to the community to come in and use. Um, where it happened was in our parking lots. But if you've ever tried to complete a job application, join a Zoom meeting or watched your child complete homework in a car, it's really not the best way to access the internet. So we adapted and changed and we started loaning hotspots and laptops and a shout out to EAC and Snohomish County who helped administer our CARES Act funding for this. It was very successful, it's still successful and it breaks down one of the barriers. But for some in our community and for many on this call today and I will join Russ and say, please fill out the uh, survey, uh, mountains and buildings are another barrier to access. But I think the biggest barrier to access that we see is the cost and then uh, having people understand the relevance. So it is an economic problem when people can't access the internet. And from our data, we know that 40% of people who cannot access the internet 
have an infrastructure gap or challenge. And of that group, 60%, it's a choice not to. It's due to cost, they don't see the value or other personal reasons. So we often think of the library as a place for those without access. It's a critical role we play, but it's not our only role. And I'd like to ask the question today, what if we didn't have to bridge the access gap? What could we do with our resources? I'd like to pose, pose the argument that libraries already equipped with amazing staff and access to resources are the best place for learners, entrepreneurs, job seekers, and anyone who needs to use the internet, which would be all of us. For learning, students need guides and mentors as they look for information. Access to STEM learning and research is a critical uh, infrastructure issue. We have online homework support. These are experts who can assist your kids with their homework and who doesn't need that at eight o'clock at night when you don't know the answer to the math question or how to help. For entrepreneurs, we are your go-to space for business information. We subscribe to databases that are out of reach for most businesses due to cost and we can help you navigate what are sometimes cumbersome interfaces. For job seekers, we have free access to Microsoft classes where you can become certified at no cost. And we started running a CompTIA cohort that trains community members to be certified for IT jobs. And we um, are seeing our first groups getting hired in Snohomish County. We can also help you navigate social media if you need a LinkedIn account. And here's a little piece of information I picked up. Russ's only social media use is LinkedIn. And so he can uh, affirm or deny that, but we will help you learn how to use LinkedIn and become an active user. We will, you can also access Consumer Reports, read the New York Times or the Seattle Times for free. This is where I believe libraries are at their best, connecting communities to inf the information they need and they want. And with the work that Russ and Council Member Nearing are leading, once our community has affordable, reliable and accessible access to the internet, our public library is the catalyst for full adoption. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Council Member Neary. Thank you, Lois, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to the Economic Alliance for putting this together. And it's a pleasure to be here with two great partners and Lois and Snow Isle and all the great work that they're doing. And then Russ and the State Broadband Office have just been a tremendous help in getting uh, the broadband action team up and running here in Snohomish County. And, and so really appreciate their assistance. Well, as we've heard, access to reliable high-speed internet is a growing issue in our communities. While most urban and incorporated areas have internet, there's lots of pockets in our county that don't have reliable service or many areas that don't have any service at all. Even some of our cities throughout Snohomish County have only one provider in them, and that limits options for residents. And so the first step in determining how and where we want to expand broadband access is having reliable data to work off of. And so I really appreciated that Susan in the chat had put the uh, link to the broadband test that uh, both Russ and Lois had mentioned. And if you could take that test and then share it far and wide within your networks, that would be a huge help because that allows us to build that uh, data that we can then use to qualify for projects. So this has been one of the hurdles for many years in bringing internet to more people has been gathering that reliable data. Uh, the data provided by the FCC has been the only source of information for several years, but uh, it's really unreliable data. Uh, generally, it says that an area is covered if it has at least one provider in a zip code. As we know, there are many rural areas within any, any given zip code in Snohomish County that are very different from urban areas uh, in, in that same zip code. And so according to the FCC data, these rural areas would be covered, which obviously isn't the case, even, even if there's just one home in the entire zip code that has access. So new, better data is critical to expanding broadband service to more residents and businesses. And as we know, more of our lives are becoming dependent on having access to reliable high-speed internet, making this a really critical time to be focused on this effort. You know, we were aware of the gaps in internet coverage before COVID and uh, broadband access was uh, a highlighted issue, but the pandemic has really exposed these significant gaps and the degree to which we all rely on the internet access. We've had to learn to work from home. Our kids have had to learn to work, to uh, learn from home. And then many people have accessed healthcare from home and a whole host of other things have been done now from home using the internet. Many students have been significantly impacted during this time due to the lack of reliable internet at home. And although we're on the recovery uh, from COVID, many of new ways of doing things are gonna be here to stay, I think, post COVID. Uh, businesses have realized they don't necessarily need all their employees at the same physical office at the same time to get the job done. Schools may potentially adopt hybrid learning models moving forward to accommodate 
growing populations and healthcare can now be more accessible to people who can't take time off for doctor's visits or other telehealth related appointments. And so I think reliable high speed internet is going to continue to be a growing need in our communities and uh, really important that we be taking steps to be ready for the future. So in partnership with Russ and the Washington State Broadband Office, uh, Executive Summers and Councilmember Lowe and I formed what's called the Snohomish County Broadband Action Team. And so there are currently about 30 broadband action teams throughout the state. Our broadband action team is made up of stakeholders from just about every sector of our communities. And I see many are, uh, are on this call, which is greatly appreciated, including Snow Owl Libraries and the Economic Alliance and several others. Uh, but we've got service providers, so Comcast, Wave, and Zipli have all been great participants, business leaders, education leaders, healthcare providers, representatives from nonprofits and local government, state agencies, and utility providers. Um, and the port is another provider, the port of Everett. And so the goals of this broadband action team are to increase participation in speed and access survey, which, uh, which we've talked about a little bit, and then identify shovel ready projects in our community and work to connect those projects with funding opportunities. So we held our first meeting on March 4th for the broadband action team. Uh, Russ was at that meeting and gave a great presentation on how we can work with the state broadband office moving forward. And we also presented an overview of the broadband action team and the role that it can play in this effort moving forward. And then finally, we, uh, named, we called for Broadband Access Week in Snohomish County, which was just a little while back. And during Broadband Access Week, we really pushed getting that survey out and we're continuing to do that. Um, and so now that, you know, next steps, I think, for broadband action, we're continuing to build that data through the survey. Uh, while we do that work, we wanna work with our list of stakeholders to use data that we do have and that we have received to identify areas that will be most easily reached by branching off of existing infrastructure. And so to accomplish this, what we're proposing is a study to identify all the projects that would need to be completed to expand access. And so a comprehensive study like this would allow us to have a concrete list of projects, and then we have the data to support the need there um, when we're looking to access funding. And so we'll be working with the state broadband office to uh, advocate for specific project funding from various state or federal funding agencies, as well as private investment from service providers and others. Um, additionally, council member Lowe and I have been advocating for some of the new COVID relief funding coming from the American Rescue Plan to be allocated toward this effort. Snohomish County government has received, I think 162 million from the federal government. And so the hope would be that a portion of those funds would be used for broadband access throughout Snohomish County. Um, so we continue to be very thankful to all of our partners, including the Economic Alliance, Snow Isle, uh, the State Broadband Office, and again, a whole host of others who are on this call. Uh, none of this would be possible without all the great partnership of various sectors throughout Snohomish County. And we look forward to seeing this great work continue and hopefully expanding broadband access um, uh, in the weeks and months and years to come. So thank you all and happy to answer any questions if there are any. Councilmember Neary, it looks like um, Brett has a question here. Is there a priority list of who's being targeted for broadband access? Yeah, great question. So we have the survey data, as I mentioned, through the, through the speed test that Russ mentioned. And so if you go on the State Department of Commerce website, you can see a map and you can see where the gaps are. But our next step, which we haven't done yet, is to identify which specific areas or which specific projects do we want to target and to create a list of that. So that's what we're in the process of doing and getting a, a study together to put all that um, to put all that in place. So it's not finished yet, but we are in that process. How has our community's response been uh, with this broadband um, uh, questionnaire? You know, you know, if we live in, if we're at our home and we take the test, is it helpful when we're somewhere else to then do it on our cell phone? I mean, I've had been filled with lots of questions like that in places where it's rural and there isn't connectivity. How do we um, reflect that in our data? I'm happy to jump on that one. Um, you know, it, it, so yeah, what, I, what I'm really working on in my office is fixed broadband, broadband that's fixed to the home so that everybody's got a wire or a, a piece of fiber that goes into their, in another house. Uh, the mobile broadband is also important. My map will pick up on that as well. So if you do a mobile test and it's on a mobile network, it'll tell me that's a mobile a mobile carrier. And 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 like I said, the more data, the better, because we start to build some confidence in the roles around data sample sizes that make sense. And I'll give you a case in point. For those of you that were on the Snohomish County BAT initial meeting, 
uh, it's it's your frontier air park up there. You know, we had we had a we had an area in Snohomish County that really rallied hard about the fact that they were unserved. And I said, go prove it to me. You know, show me. They got on the map, and if you look on that map and you look at Frontier Air Park, I'm a, I think everybody in that air park gave gave speed test. And if you look at the one that the the state uh, results map, if you look at it and you start to drill in, there's a little area on the right hand side that kind of tells you what's going on in the window. And as you get that window narrowed down into the Frontier Air Park, you see that they are at five five down and almost one up. That's about all they have. So they were very quickly able to show that they were unserved. You know, when you start to talk about is there is there a focus on who who gets attention first? Obviously, unserved as, as defined by the state today. Anybody less than 25 megabits to the home, unserved, right? So so we start looking at that. I'm going to tell you that's moving. That's going to move quick. We're going to take that sucker up to 100 megabits. When it gets up to 100 megabits, anything below 100 is unserved. That's when we start to really start having activity around where are we going to find these areas that we're going to put as priorities. But right now, I think the priority is to continue to find these areas that are desperately in need of infrastructure. Because if you've got if you've got infrastructure that's showing like five megabits down, that is actually limited by the type of infrastructure that's there in the park. So they need to get brand new infrastructure investment in the ground there in the air park. Well, we were able to leverage that information to the providers. And uh, one of the providers came forward and, and said they'd pay for it 100 percent after a little bit of a, a, a little dog and pony that we did with the providers. You know, they, they went back and forth and said, well, we take a if you're going to give me some money, we might build in your area kind of thing. You know, in the end, uh, you know, I was excited to see Comcast came in and said, look, we'll just cover it. Let us let us get built. We'll go through the permitting now and they should have uh, fiber infrastructure to the home relatively soon. So, again, rallying around that, getting that information. And, and Snohomish County did a great job this last run on the broadband surveys. We're starting to see a very very identifiable trend. Really nice to see when you look back on my on my back end map, I can zoom out a little bit and you can really see the red and black areas, which are areas on my map show that these are areas that need focus. So to your point, where do we focus? It's time now to start to identify those and build little projects around, okay, what does that look like and how are we gonna get that done in those regions? So anyway, hopefully that answers the question. I don't know, I just ramble. <laughs> Thank you for the feedback. It's good to know. Um, it looks like we have a few other questions in here. Someone was asking if um, there are broadband action teams on the east side. Um, and is there a particular county that you'd like to know about? Does anybody? Um, I'm running down here. Yeah, it's a Spokane County. So yeah, there's, yeah. You know, and, and I got to, I, if I don't mention this, I feel like I'm going to get, I'm going to get beat, beat over the head. But, uh, you know, uh, this is also in partnership with a, with a memorandum of an understanding we have with Washington State University, because the good work they were doing over there, this broadband action team was their concept, they, they conceived it, we've taken it and made it bigger. You're now seeing over 30 bats across the state, right? We have 39 counties, we've got 30 bats. So we're starting to see a lot of, a lot of broadband action teams happening. And uh, we've got a map that shows where all those are. It was in my presentation. I don't have a presentation today, but it's, it shows all the dots. You can see if there's a dot in your area. If there's not, we go get one, you know, start asking us about how you get started. But we, uh, you know, th th there's uh, over in the Spokane and the East Side, ton of activity right now over there. I, I think almost every single county over there has has a very active broadband action team and and, uh, and they're very, uh, very aggressively pursuing this. And I think, again, everybody's at that area at that point where you guys are right now. Okay, we let's start to identify because money's coming, right? You can't just go and say, give me money. Although the county did, what, like like they said, look, we just got this big ARP money, right? There's going to be a hundred and some odd million dollars for the county. We'd like to allocate some of that broadband. Well, how much and what for, right? That's going to be the next question. And that's what I think what we're trying to train our broadband action teams now is to take that next step to say, okay, what for? What are we going to build specifically? I had a gentleman uh, messaging me here about Quincy and 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 in the Grant County area, you know, and certainly uh, quickly I can go on my map and say, okay, this is an area. It's close to fiber. Somebody just needs to come in and start building on top of it, right? So it, it, and it can get done. So um, yeah, broadband action teams are all over. How will the state priority of course. So Susan has a great question. So relative to what you're talking about, funding came through. Um, how will the state prioritize and deploy the resources that are coming to us appropriated from the legislature? And then will there be an application process um, for community-based organizations and providers to engage yeah. in that? Yeah, and, and the money that's been allocated that came out of the ARP money that came to my office, which is exciting, you know, we finally got some discretionary money that to, to, to use here. I, you know, I think we ended up in the end, we've got about $300 million is what we got. Uh, 50 of that's going to go into matching funds. So I'm going to have $50 million set aside just for matching opportunities. So anybody wants to chase federal money, 
We've got tremendous federal money coming. We've got, uh, we've got a, a big Native American uh, grant opportunity coming from NTIA. I think there's going to still be a little tiny match with that, and our office will be able to put money against that. Uh, USDA is going to have a, a billion dollars, I'm sure, in the next year of, of funds that are going to come out. We'll have the matching capability of bringing that to communities that need that support. So you'll have that amount of money. Then the other the other funds right now, we're still trying to figure out exactly what a best uh, a best way to deploy those funds will be. Uh, the legislature has said they, they do want to see that in public infrastructure. They want to see it at minimum a public-private partnership uh, and public use for the infrastructure that's built. So we will start to look at, uh, you know, I'll tell you what I did on Easter weekend, I forced all the providers into a crazy moment uh, and I did a fire drill. I said, okay, providers in the state, uh, to show the legislature we could spend this money because they didn't think we had enough projects to, uh, to, to justify any kind of large sum of money. I said, give me your projects that would serve unserved areas as defined by the state where you might have already plans to build, where you may have already materials because we're gonna have a big issue coming up. We're gonna have a big supply side issue. Materials are gonna be hard. Fiber's already a year out, right? So where you might have already materials, you've got some, some studies going away, that kind of stuff. I ended up getting back from both public and private providers about $2.7 billion worth of projects in the state. So what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this and be real methodical about it. I'd like to say, okay, here's the state of Washington, put up a wall, here's the $2.7 billion worth of projects, lay them onto the state start to see where there's overlap, start to see where there's areas that didn't have any type of, uh, of, uh, of efforts around study or, or, or building there. See what we need to do in order to fill the gap, put that against our map so that we can see where the areas are that are demonstrating unserved, and then start to work with the communities and the partners that will allow me to leverage that money to another level. I don't wanna spend $200 million or $250 million, whatever it is, for dollar for dollar infrastructure projects. It just doesn't make sense. I'd like to see that $250 million turn into about 500 to $700 million, right? So I'd like to find partners that say, okay, we're ready. We're going we're gonna to serve the most. You know, we've got this and, and we'd like to do it in a way that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, we can leverage some of our funds too. You know, they bring some of their, their private or public money to the table. So that's what we're going to do. So keep, keep, keep engaged here. We're going to start figuring that out here relatively soon. We're the dog that caught the bus. You know, we, we talk a good game and now all of a sudden we got we to gotta do something about it. So, you know, the, the good news is we're going to staff up. We're going to get, uh, we're going to get a team in here. And we're going to really make some good, uh, good things happen here in the state. Thank you, Russ. Um, there's another question here um, from a school district standpoint, residing in both Snohomish and Island. Um, Charlotte's asking which, um, broadband action team, should she be focused on making sure that students have more equitable access? Both. Yeah, great. Yeah. Both. Go ahead, Russ. Okay, great question, Charlotte. Um, and, and I would say in addition to the broadband action team, I've been working with Janet St. Clair uh, from Island County and then Lisa Janicki from Skagit County on, on kind of a circle of access. If you start from, you know, the Darrington area and then through Arlington and Stanwood and Camino, and then you come up Anacortes and out uh, into Skagit County. And so we've been working together on that effort and would love to touch base with you on that. But I, I would recommend getting involved with both. With involved with both, involved We'd love to have the Stanwood Camino School District on the Snohomish County Broadband Action Team, but would also highly recommend you get in touch with uh, Commissioner St. Clair on Camino Island because she's doing great work over in Island County. Here's another one around funding. Um, Tim's asking, do you envision the funding going towards infrastructure placement or monthly operational costs, subscription costs? Yeah, good question and a great timing for that question too. So the money that came to this office is gonna be infrastructure money. It's for capital, capital builds. Uh, but at this time right now, we're seeing, uh, I think there's gonna be about $10 billion in federal money coming down for affordability metrics. Uh, there's going to be a thing called the emergency broadband benefit that's that's getting underway as we speak, which will offer folks that can't afford broadband $50 a month subsidies. Those on reservations get $75 a month subsidy toward their broadband uh, toward their broadband bill. So keep an eye on that. And I think you know this. I think you know just seeing uh, uh, Commissioner Rosenwurzel, Chair Chair Rosenwurzel yesterday, or I guess it was two weeks ago, came up and said, look, I'm gonna make this a priority and I'd like to see this funding stick around after COVID. So we as a state in this legislative session tried to address that. We looked at it, we came up with a couple of different pieces of legislation that would might help uh, with the cost of affordability, some of the tools and, and the skills building uh, that, that, didn't, that didn't gain the steam it needed to get past. But 
maybe that was fortuitous because on the federal level, it looks like they're going to be bringing some programs forward. So keep an eye on that. But the money we have right now is, is going to be strictly capital. Thank you, Russ. And Councilmember Nearing, um, there's another question that's a little more um, just off the conversation of funding, um, but more about um, infrastructure. Will the Elon Musk low altitude satellite internet service be a viable option to Washington State for rural citizens? Yeah, great question. And Russ might, he's probably much better qualified to answer this than me, but I have been hearing a lot about this. And from, from what I've heard from residents in Snohomish County have used it, it's been really successful. Uh, I would think it would be the same for rural citizens in other areas of the state, but but Russ might want to add on to that. Yeah, absolutely. A tool in the toolbox right now. You know, that's one that's that's for folks that that don't have any other option. That's a, a stellar option right now. We're seeing great, uh, great success with folks. We, as you know, we help the whole tribe come up and get 100 percent connected on the on the SpaceX uh, infrastructure. The challenge right now is, 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 you know, when you talk about affordability, you know, they've got a one price point right now. It's 100 bucks a month. You know, and that 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 tends to be a challenge for folks, uh, and certainly will always be a tool in the toolbox. But in my opinion, right now, I think we have to think big. I think as a as a country, as a state, we have to start thinking if we're going to be dumping the type of infrastructure money that we're talking about right now uh, from DC. I'm hearing, I, I I think we're all hearing the B's and T's. You know, as far as types of numbers, and if you've got a hundred billion dollars that are going to go into broadband infrastructure in our country. Washington State is probably 3% of that population. So if we had $3 billion, we might be able to just get a fiber connect connection to almost everybody here. So we have to think a little differently. In the past, we've always said, oh, that's just too expensive. You know, but I think now the conversation is if we don't build, how much is that going to cost, right? So I think I personally, I want to see connectivity to the home and everybody has a physical connection with the opportunity to have that as a tool in the toolbox where there's otherwise not a, not a financial feasible. Uh, you know, it's not feasible. Hey, gee, I'd like to build a little on what Russ was just talking about that, because um, there was a question or a comment earlier about the equity issue. And I think um, Russ is really touching on that, that I think about when rural, it wasn't alive, but rural electrification, just in case you think I'm old, uh, and phone adoption, right? That it, you know, people didn't see a need for a phone in every home. And then you had uh, shared lines where you had five families on a phone. And now we can't imagine not just a phone in our home, but a phone in our pocket. And so I think that the same thing is happening with broadband and we have to get that infrastructure in place. And then as we talked about the library is well positioned as a trusted community member to build those skills and the ability to use it. But I think we're a little upside down when we're being the provider. Um, that was the point I was making that if we're the provider, it's not really reasonable to say you need to make a phone call, go to the library and, and use the phone there, we would sort of scoff at that. So I think that's what we're trying, I think we're trying to turn back correctly. Everyone has access in their home and then we're back to helping you with the skills and building the agility and that starts to break down the equity issue. And if I could tap on just a little bit more what Lois just said, when, when you talk about equity and I, I saw a comment earlier about, uh, uh, about translations and making certain that, you know, for non-English speakers, you know, when we were, we, we, as we started to do this, uh, this mapping, we ran into, we were in Yakima County and we worked with the VAT team there and they quickly said, you know, we're dealing with a lot of uh, migrant farm workers that need, you know, need translation and thank God for their VAT team, you know, because they took that, they took leadership and they said, okay, we're going to get an 800 number up here that allows folks that don't have broadband access to call into a, a Spanish speaking line and they can talk about, you know, put their, and we'll put their dot on the map for them. Right, so we were we were leveraging that that uh, service there. Uh, they translated it in the in the native uh, Yakima uh, language too. And so so again, why the local bat team is so important? It's because each each area is going to be unique, and they're all going to bring their own local challenges and their local unique. Uh, opportunities to the table. And so to allow those bat teams to come forward and say, hey, you know what, we can help translate. We do have now in our budget, you know, we've had no budget. So this is this first time, July will be my budget. It'll be the first time I've ever had budget. And in that budget, we have translation services. We've got all the things that we're going to need to try to start to really make certain that we are equitable across this, across this divide. And we are hiring a, a digital equity and, and inclusion officer manager, you know, within this office. So we're really going to focus on that because it is, it's as, it's as, it's as critical as the infrastructure piece. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to make an investment in that place too. Thank you, Russ. Just in terms of um, scope and scale, I'm curious, how do we rank, like, how does Washington state rank um, 
comparative to the country in terms of need, infrastructure need? Well, I mean, if, if, if you base need on the fact that we're probably one of the top, if not the top two, at least top three connected states in the country, does that, maybe that puts us low on the list, right? You know, but uh, I would contend that, you know, when you start to talk about what does connected mean, it's adequacy of connectivity. We've gone through a, we've gone through a pandemic where we've seen, uh, you know, connectivity means different things now. But, you know, home is, is now where we're doing multiple things simultaneously and we need, we need more robust connectivity. So, you know, everybody's got, a, everybody has the ability to touch a little internet in this, in this state. Uh, and so that makes us look good. But in the end, I think what we need to do is really make certain we've got future per scalable, robust infrastructure. And, you know, to that goal, the Washington State Broadband Offices, again, mission vision, right? Leading by that, our vision and our crazy moonshot goal is by 2028, everybody's got 150 megabit symmetrical type of connectivity at their home. That's 150 up and 150 down. That's, that's robust. That's future proof. We're going to be spending my kids' future, you know, your earnings on our infrastructure today. We better build infrastructure that he can use, right? So it's going to be all about us trying to figure out how do we get this type of tech, technology in there. And one more on the low earth orbit while we're talking about it. You know, it's, it's a new sexy toy and it's, it's fun and it's shiny, but it's not scaled. It's not gone up to, to the type of scale it's going to have to do. They don't understand what's going to happen because we've got multiple providers getting ready to launch satellites. We're looking at multiple satellites. We're looking at spectrum and frequency challenges. There's a lot of things going on that are unknown about that. So while it's there and it's a great tool in the toolbox, let's not put our eggs in that basket. Let's put our eggs in the basket. We know it works, you know, and we know we'll scale for the future for, our, for, our, for, for the folks in, in the state. So anyway. Just to add to that too, that the, you know, we often, yeah, we come out as one of the most connected states, but we forget that the people who aren't connected uh, are sometimes the most vulnerable and, and percentages are, can be really throw you off and make you feel really good about where you're at when you actually dig down into the numbers and see who isn't connected and who is multi-connected. But just a little, uh, since Gary's not here, I'll tell a story on him, but we uh, were meeting and he was on a Wi-Fi hotspot and we had to end the meeting because it just wasn't, it kept breaking up, it kept freezing. So even when you're connected, you might not be connected. So I think that's an important uh, piece of what we're trying to build here is, is uh, reliable, that really reliable, no matter where you are in the state, you can connect with people. And just to echo that, I mean, how many of us in this room with families are trying to work and you have, you know, kids on, and if, if you're on, you know, even sometimes you're on broadband and you're having problems, it's glitching or you're getting dropped. Um, just imagine having three or four people on one hotspot, like, and Lois, I'm curious, how many hotspots did Snow Libraries distribute? I've a heard good number. I'm going to, yeah. uh, I know I have, there's a couple of people on the call who some will be able to pop that into the chat, but I will say they're reservable and we have waiting lists. And uh, what we're doing is pairing the laptop with the Wi-Fi hotspot. And so we are letting people take them home. We were first using them, uh, which was great in the summer. You know, when the weather's nice, there's nothing better than sitting outdoors in Washington in the summertime. But come January, outdoors is not where you want to be. So we have people taking them home and they're uh, we have 125 and there's a wait list. So um, we, you know, I think, again, it's been a great service. It's a great bridge as we build this and we'll continue to do it, but I, um, it is not a long-term solution. And your community thanks you and your staff for your hard work. You, you jumped in the deep end head first from the beginning. Thank you. Um, there's a question, Nick, a great question Nick has around um, increasing adoption of um, broadband, use of broadband um, by those who haven't um, used it, don't see value in it, don't know how to use it, like community education aspect. What do we do about that? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And, and you know, I've, I'm hyper, I've been hyper focused on getting the fiber to the door, right? So I'm that guy, right? There are tremendous uh, efforts underway across this state by a number of community-based organizations, libraries, and different folks that are starting to begin or continuing the good work of of, of encouraging adoption. And I know Monica Babine was on here, but it looks like she's left. She's working on a, a number of programs with the Association of Washington Businesses around, uh, you know, tech change makers and, and different, different, different avenues to, to start to create those opportunities for learning and, and the education on, on how to use it and why it's important. Uh, and again, once we get the digital equity 
uh, officer manager position that filled, that's going to be their focus. You know, I'm the 24 seven guy. I wake up, go to bed thinking about how I'm going to get your fiber, your home, right? We need somebody 24 seven waking up and going to bed, thinking about how we're going to make certain everybody has, has access and can afford it and, and, uh, and understands why it's important. So more to come on that. And I think we're starting to see again, COVID woke up that gorilla, right? That's that 800 pound gorilla that said, you know, Hey, I used to, I used to do this from my work and from school and that's, that was my internet access. And now all of a sudden I don't have either one to go to and uh, you know, and I can't afford it and I don't know how to use it here, you know? So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, we're, 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 we're on our way to really, I think, putting a, a, a serious effort around that. I was um, thinking about that question and I remember when my mother asked me one time, what's that WWW on the bottom of the screen when we first had the internet? So this is years ago. And, and so we started a program in the library to invite people and we'd have 50 people come to a class and we would show them, we, they wouldn't have enough computers for them to actually do it themselves. And we'd walk them through the very basics of how to, what a link was and how to click on a link. I mean, things that we just don't really even think about anymore. And so I, I think what I've seen libraries evolve into is it's just part of everything we do so if we're doing a stem class with kids we're teaching them about the internet when we do um, any kind of program we're always integrating it into that and um uh now i just lost my train of thought so i will see if it um oh i think the other uh is we do see families teach each other right and communities teach each other so part of it is building the strength of our community and teaching part to teach the rest and um, so I'm, I'm excited about uh, the other, I know the other thing I was going to say is uh, we meet uh, statewide librarian, library directors meet regularly, and we've been talking about the value of this in our role as we move into building those skills so people adopt the, um, the internet and use it. So shifting gears a little bit, probably um, Council Member Nearing, uh, there's a question here from Dan, City of Everett, um, and the need for robust access in strategic areas with high job concentration from an economic perspective. Comments on that? Yeah, and I'm really glad that this is brought up. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important when we think about areas like the City of Everett, Payne Field, the Cascade Industrial Center up north, or Kenyon Park down south. I think it's really difficult to be competitive in attracting employers and good family wage jobs if we don't have this infrastructure built out in those critical areas that, that I think Dan is referencing. And so I think that's super important. And that seems to be a focus of the entire Puget Sound region is making sure we can do that so that we can attract those uh, employers and sectors and jobs that we wanna have here in Stonehenge County. Thank you. Um, Chris, for Chris, um, Zhang Yang, I'm not sure. I'm looking for Chris. I'm not sure who you're directing this to, but the question is about um, uh, broadband equity and plans to improve better broadband periods, faster speeds, no data caps, et cetera. Maybe Russ? Uh, you know, I think to that to that to that concern is what I what I'd mentioned earlier. I think we found that that a broadband access as we know it today. Holy moly! Sorry. Wow. <laughs> sorry. I'm looking out at the ocean right now, and there are three beautiful dolphins just going across the. It's just gorgeous. Anyway, sorry. Um, I I, uh, I get distracted easy. Um, instead of squirrel, it's dolphin. Um, so so you know, in in our world today, we've now found that that broadband access is different as defined. We used to know it as, hey, I just need to be able to download Netflix, or I need to up 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 upload a game, or I need a little bit of uh, time for video to my you know to my you know do a little video chat or whatever. And now we're finding that the home is the school, is the healthcare, is the VPNs for both husband and wife, and and the kid at the same time, and 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 you know it's all all simultaneous. So th there is a priority in this office. The priority, as I just mentioned, 150 symmetrical. We are building future proof scalable infrastructure that's what we're going to do we're not going to screw around with just enough right this is our opportunity to really make a huge difference and so there's a huge priority right now around making certain that we get that that big big robust broadband up okay council member Neri, um dan's coming back at it same question but prioritizing like how do we prioritize these within our within our community it's a great question 
Yeah, it is. And I think it goes back to what I mentioned about putting together that study. So Okanagan County put together a really comprehensive broadband study. I think it's like 50 or 60 pages. Um, Russ will be more familiar with it than me, but they identified like their top 20 areas of need, both for residential and business throughout Okanagan County. And then they had all the data to support it and uh, infrastructure uh, and everything else. And so the hope is that in Snohomish County, we can do something very similar and identify a list of needs, both for residential and for business and economic development, and then use that and use the data, data that we've collected to go after uh, funding at both the state and the federal level. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? This is great conversation. And so many of you in this room have been engaged in this from, from the beginning. Um, thank you for all of your engagement and input and um, advocacy for your local communities and um, the greater good. Uh, question around the um, CIC in Arlington Marysville area, what's being done to leverage this activity to brew broadband, which Russ, you, or maybe Councilmember Naren, you touched on this, but maybe a little more discussion in this space. There's so much growth happening there. Yeah, and I think one of the cities would probably be uh, better to better to answer this, but I do know that there's been some work around 5G in that area throughout Arlington and Marysville and the Cascade Industrial Center. So I know both of the cities are doing a really good job of prioritizing this uh, as you know as more businesses are coming and as there's more economic development in that region. So I'm not you know from the county perspective, we're not uh, we're not actively involved with that, but uh, I think that'd be a great question for the city. So I do know that, that they're prioritizing that. Mayor Naring, I see you there. Any additional comments on that? You haven't hit the mute button. We see you, but okay. That's okay. We'll come back around to that one. Um, let's see. Yes. Dan agree. Downtown Everett Canyon Park, Southwest. There's there's lots of like these core hub areas and conversation happening um, to attract business growth, like expansion of what, what's already here and attract new. Um, oh, Mayor Naring, Katie has you covered, I think. Go ahead. There we go. Thanks. It was saying that it wouldn't let me unmute, but thank you, Katie. Um yeah, I know I, I think with the um, 5G, I know the county invested some uh, money last summer, I believe it was, and uh, that is one of our top priorities is technological infrastructure with regards to 5G. It's something the companies that take a look really want. And so um, I know the county council and executive summer's office, we're, uh, we're working on some things there. And so we're, we're excited about that. And I think that's obviously critical to the build out of the Cascade Industrial Center. So it sounds like pretty much what was said, but just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. And PUD's support and and um, like energizing that that area. I mean, there's it's it's a it's a team effort to make that all happen. So um, a nod to them as well. <laughs> Any other thoughts, questions? There's there's lots of space to cover in this. Um, someone touched. I have a question actually. Someone touched on. Um, I think Russ, you. We were talking about funding and um, prioritizing public-private partnerships. Um, what does that look like? What does A plus look like for our community? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. There's some best case. There's some best practices going on right now in our state. And if you look at Grant, uh, Shalana, Douglas counties, those counties, you know, have had, uh, you know, they've had some. They've had. They've been very successful on the revenue side, and so they've been able to leverage some of that revenue and reinvest it into fiber infrastructure. And I think Grant, Shalane, and Douglas are all built out about 75% fiber to the home, that, you know, to all the citizens in those counties. And it's because of the, the good work that the public infrastructure is doing there. Now, each one of those counties, none of those PUDs do retail. So they allow the retail providers, the private providers, to come in and provide retail services on their, on their, on their extended capital investment that they've made. And that, that makes for a, a, a tremendous partnership. 70, you know, 80, 90% of the cost of, of putting broadband in is usually putting a plow on the ground. And, and, you know, now I've got to offset that cost eventually. If you mitigate that for the providers, the private folks, they're going to come in and they're going to really flourish. So you see Grant County, I think Grant County brags about the fact they've got somewhere between 14 and 17 providers competing on that infrastructure 
to get 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 connectivity to people's homes. And when you have that type of, of competition, you're going to see a good, you know, you're going to see good price point. You're going to see good competitive offerings. You're going to see stellar service because that's how people are going to differentiate themselves. So that's, I think that's a great example of a best practice of public private partnership. And I'd like to see more of that. And now with the PUD retail bill that's gone through, you know, they have the opportunity to do retail. I doubt you're going to see a lot of PUD doing retail but you're gonna see them per perhaps pursuing funding now and, and a lot more efforts to build those infrastructures out and a lot for those private providers who do it really well come in and, and compete on those networks. So I think that's, that's, your best, uh, that's your best example. If I could just add on to that real briefly, I mentioned earlier a, a partnership between Snohomish and Skagit and Island counties on that circle, kind of in the Northern part of Snohomish County. And what Skagit County has been doing, they've got a great partnership between the Port of Skagit and the Skagit PUD and they've created an entity called SkagitNet, I want to say. And so that's the entity that's involved with trying to help build out that circle. So pretty similar to what Russ is talking about on the east side uh, is also happening uh, up in Skagit County. So it sounds like there's plenty of opportunity coming. Lots of funding, Snowish PUDs laid some groundwork. Um, Lots happening in the CIC up north and um, down in Canyon Park. I mean, there's just there's lots of opportunity, and we're all most of us in our home offices with lots of time to do strategy work and outreach and planning for all of this. So, um, if there aren't any other questions, um, I'm going to um, sign off. Thank you so much, Lois, Councilmember Nearing, Russ, for being with us and just informing us of of what's going on, what we have access to as a community, kind of where we sit in the middle of all this. Um, great news that there's some funding around this, but um, collectively as a community, we have work to do together and um, just wanted to give you the opportunity to provide any closing remarks. Um, I'll hand it off to Council Member Nearing first. Yeah, thanks, Angie. Really appreciate the Economic Alliance uh, hosting this, and it's great to be on with uh, Snow Isle and the State Broadband Office. I was just in the middle of typing into the chat. If there are folks on the call, I know we've got a lot of broadband action team members who are here on the call, but if you're not involved and you want to be, I'm going to put a contact in that you can get in touch with, and we'd love to have you on board. I know we heard already from the Stanwood Camino School District, which is awesome, and so any others that want to get involved, we'd love to have you on board and really excited about these efforts moving forward. Russ, uh, it, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. This is an unprecedented time. I appreciate your opportunity, uh, the opportunity to come in here and, and share with you people. I appreciate the great work that's going on up there in Snow, Snohomish County. But like you said, it's just the beginning. We need to now do a better job of planning. And, and like council member, I'll just call you Nate. Well, like Nate said, uh, you know, it's time to start to identify those areas and let's do a good plan. You guys have a lot of money coming your way, you know, both the county and there's going to be more money coming to the state, more money coming. It's time to use that wisely and use a little bit of that money to do a great plan. And, and as you know, there, there, there's a great example of good plans going on. Nate mentioned one about Okanagan County where you have, you know, defined areas of, of build. So use it, go plan, get ready. Let's, let's, let's get some stuff done. I'm, I'm just looking forward to working with y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Lois. Uh, I guess a uh, ditto, and I think Dan said, right, there's a sense of urgency at a time that we don't want to miss this uh, the door is wide open and we should walk through. So excited to have such strong commitment across the entire county. So really appreciate this coming together this morning. Thank you. Um, thank you all three of you for your time and um, leading this conversation and the background and, and knowledge you bring to the conversation um, and the hard work you do. Um, it's been really impactful here in our community. So um, I also wanted to share with you next week, same day, same time, um, we will have another coffee chat on the impact of life science industry in Snohomish County. Um, just go to Economic Alliance events to sign up. Um, you'll get the link. And I wish you all a wonderful Tuesday and hope to see you next week. Take care. Have a great day.